The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Amidst a housing crisis, low vacancy rates, and rising rents. And for some, a breaking point that's prompted what's called a rent strike. Tonight, we'll debate the merits and repercussions of rent strikes with tenants and landlords. Then, Jayan Jagannathan sits down with author Marcus McCann about his new book about, and titled, Park Cruising, and its significance to queer communities in Canada and beyond. It's Monday, June 19th, and that's next on The Agenda. Residential rents vary across the province, but what's the same from here to Thunder Bay and back is that rents are going up. And for some tenants, facing rent hikes above the provincial guidelines, they've decided it's too much. They've begun what's called a rent strike. And just as the name suggests, it means they're not paying for the roof over their head until they see the changes they want. How do such actions work? And do they work? Let's find out. We're going to ask Varun Srikanda, board member at the Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario, Kiara Padavani, co-chair and founder of the York Southwestern Tenant Union, Kayla Andrade, president of Ontario Landlords Watch, and Ricardo Tranjan, senior researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives and the author of The Tenant Class, a picture of which we are seeing right now with a lovely apartment building on the cover. Uh, good to welcome everybody here to TVO tonight for this conversation. Ricardo, start us off. A rent strike is exactly what? In a rent strike, uh, organized tenors, tenants decide to withhold rent to force the, the landlord to come to the negotiation table. Their demands are usually around um, rent increases, repairs, or evictions. Um, in some ways, rent strikes are very similar to labor strikes in that business owners have capital assets that generate revenue. The strategy of a strike is to stop the flow of revenue. You call the attention of the business owner and you provide them some incentive or some pressure to come to the negotiation table and to try and come to an agreement as soon as possible because they want revenue to resume. Okay, Kayla, rent strikes, or I should say labor strikes, when the contract is over and you've got your mandate to do so, are legal. Are rent strikes legal? Definitely not. When a rent strike happens, it goes on the concept that a tenant is going to withhold a rent, and the only way for you to withhold your rent is to... Um, is if the landlord didn't give you your lease at the beginning of your lease and then you can hold a one month's rent. Besides that, it's not legal and what it's gonna do is just put tenants in a harm way of being potentially evicted. Kiara, what's the goal of the rent strike? At the end of the day, you do it because you want what? Well, I'm here uh, as co-chair of the York Southwest and Tenant Union and one of our member tenant associations, 33 King Street, uh, has made the decision to go on a rent strike by withholding their rent, like Ricardo said, until a negotiated settlement can happen with the landlord against something called above guideline rent increases. Uh, these are tactics that landlords use, especially large corporate landlords, to get around following rent control. Uh, the position of the Tenant Association and the 33 King Tenant, um, York Southwest and Tenant Union is that landlords have to pay to maintain their building. It's, it's what they receive rent for. So keeping their, their building in a good state of rep repair is what tenants are paying. It's actually literally what landlords get paid to do. It's their side of the agreement. Um, and when they're passing on these costs, in the case of 33 King Street, rents have gone up three times higher than rent control in the last five years. Even during the pandemic in 2021, when there was supposed to be a rent freeze, where other landlords were not allowed to increase rents. Dream Unlimited, which is the landlord and owner of 33 King Street, still increased rents 3% um, for tenants in 33 King. 33 King is a building in well, the northwest part of Toronto? In Weston. Weston, okay, got it. How much are landlords allowed to increase rents this year? So this year, a landlord is capped at increasing it by 2.5%. Um, that isn't enough 
That's not enough to keep up with maintenance. That's not enough to keep up with the mortgage, the property taxes, the insurance. If you look at the city of Toronto, we increased property taxes, I believe, more than 2.5. I believe it was 2.9 this year. That's uh, So already property owners are having to deal with more expenses that they can't handle. Now, when you have all these expenses, you're unable to address the really important stuff, which is critical maintenance issues, addressing tenants' maintenance concerns, and upgrading the critical infrastructure of some of these aging buildings in Toronto. Who decided it can only be 2.5%? That was decided by the province, and it's uh, far too low. They need to take into account all the expenses on landlords. Look at the interest rates and the amount it costs to carry a rental property in Ontario. 2.5% hmm. doesn't make the cut. Well, and inflation's running over 5% right now? It is, now, over 5 6 yes. or 7 at yeah. one point over the last couple of years. So uh, what falls behind when you can only raise the... I should go to you on this then. Uh, Kayla, what falls behind when you only get 2.5% rent increase, but you actually need 5 6 7 whatever? Your housing stock. That falls behind. If you look at 2.5% increase of what the landlords are allowed, and we can say that the rents have skyrocketed, in the cities, but they're not the units that are underneath the rent, rent control. This is for the turnover of units that are within our, our province that are doing turnover. A lot of the properties that are aging population at 2.5%, that is going to be, all of this rent strike movement, that's coming from, a this is a symptom of the rent controls. It's catching up with our economy, and that's why we're seeing a decrease in the small landlords who are 70% of the housing stock getting out of this business. And that's why it's extremely important to make sure that we understand it as a business and the numbers need to make sense. And the government has controlled this industry so long that it's causing landlords and tenants to fight each other. And instead, the tenants and the landlords need to come to the table together contact Steve Clark, Doug Downey, every layer of our so issues. Two cabinet ministers that you've just referenced there. Okay, Ricardo, where, where are you coming down on this? I'm coming down looking at data on an aggregate level because you can't have it both ways. You cannot say that rents are skyrocketing and, you can, and, and the same sentence say that rents are not going up enough, that they're only going up by 2.5%. So when we take a step back and we look at CMHC data, you see that year over year, Average rents go above, go up by way above the rent guideline. And that's for a number of reasons. Because you have the loophole, you have the above guideline rent increase. It's because between tenancies, landlords increase rents on average by 28% in Toronto. Uh, it's because year of. Year over year? No, between tenancies. Between tenancies, I Between see. Between tenancies, okay. there's no vacancy controls in Toronto. There's vacancy decontrol, so they can catch up. So in a building, there's always a turnover, which sometimes is around 10 to 12 percent. So for that, you, those units in the building, the rents are actually going up by way more. So we have to think in terms of averages, and the average is much higher than the rent guideline increases. And so when you look at that way, you can tell that um, it is not a fact that landlords are constrained by the guideline rent increases they are increasing rents by way more. Well, let me pursue that because, okay, the guideline is 2.5%, but as you point out, you can apply to go above the guideline if you can demonstrate that you have just cause for doing so. Mm -hmm. so what is the maximum above the guideline that you can get? You can get up to 3% three years in a row. So that will add to 9% over three years, compound on top of whichever number you got for the guideline. Okay, right? Varun, is that, uh, I mean, th three is higher than two and a half. Mm -hmm. Not a lot higher than two and a half, so does that go any distance to allowing you to do what you need to do? No, absolutely not. Not when inflation's at 5.5, it's running close to seven. We need much higher than that. We need a rent increase of at least 5.5%. That's the only way small landlords are going to be able to continue to make ends meet. Most small landlords and most of the members at Solo, they're not cash flow positive. Solo it, is the name small of landlords of Ontario. We, most of the members there are not cash flow positive on their rentals. If they were to take uh, their units out of Ontario's rental housing stock, it would seriously drive up the cost of renting in this province. Now, between tenancies, we do increase the cost of the rental unit back to market rate. Now, if we want that market rate to go lower, it's simple rule, supply and demand. We need to increase the supply. 
there is no one else. The government isn't doing their job in increasing the supply of purpose-built rentals. They don't incentivize developers to build apartment buildings. They say it's actually been higher in the past year than it has in the past 10. Yes, but that's the, we're catching up for the mistakes that we've been making the last decade. We've been seriously slacking. We built a ton of PBRs, purpose-built rentals, in the 60s and in the 70s. And those are the aging buildings that we are currently trying to maintain and keep up with. Kiara, let me get the 411 on your rent strike. First of all, when did it start? It started on June 1st. Did everybody do it? We had half of the building commit to doing that. That's 200 tenants to going on a rent strike on June 1st. And there's a few things I'd like to respond to. Um, we talk about running a business. In the case of 33 King Street, the landlord dream has 50% of the income they collect from rents is profit. 50% of the income they're collecting from tenants at 33 King Street is profit. How do you know that? It was in their latest financial statements, okay. something that they shared publicly with their with the public. So when when Dream Unlimited turns around and says, you know, cries poor or says these are necessary repairs, our position is you have been collecting 50% profit of rent. Any good business person would know to set some of that aside to make sure that you are providing housing um, accommodations that are safe and well-maintained. Mm -hmm. It's actually the very basis of the other side of the agreement. A, land, uh, a landlord agrees to providing a safe place for people to live, and tenants agree to pay their rent. So half the tenants who are not paying their rent, who are on the rent strike right now, what's their situation? You plan to just keep doing this as long as it takes, or what? Well, I know that some people will try to paint tenants who are withholding rent as part of a collective protest in a rent strike as, um, you know, freeloaders or criminals or breaking the law. What this is about, it's not about free rent. Every tenant on rent strike at 33 King is prepared to pay their rent when the rent strike is over. It's not about free rent. It's not about handouts. It's not about charity. What is it it's about? It's about fairness. And at 33 King Street, rents have gone up three times higher than rent control. According to rent control, in the last five years, rent should have gone up no more than 7%. Tenants at 33 King Street have seen rent increases of 22% for existing tenants, not in between tenancies, for existing tenants. And these are tenants who are the working class of our city. They are keeping our city running. You know, tenants who are personal support workers, who are nurses, who are teachers, early educators, these are people who are really, really working hard. They are decent, hardworking people, but they will not take be taken advantage of. Okay, we have, we should put this on the record here because Dream Unlimited, which owns your building, mm -hmm. uh, sent us this statement of what's going on at 33 King in the northwest part of Toronto. And here is what they've had to say. Since we acquired this property in late 2021, we've been working hard on resolving the prior owners above guideline rent increases, or AGI applications as they're called, for work completed in 2016 to 2018. We came to a solution on the prior owner's 2018 AGI application, which included a significant reduction from the original ask. Balcony restoration, as well as new window and balcony door installation, is critically necessary for the safety of our residents given the age of the building. We have made numerous efforts to meet with tenants one-on-one -on -one to develop individual payment plans as we understand the challenges that come with rent increases. To date, only 24 out of 239 residents have requested assistance. Your response, Kiara. My response to that is, once again, Dream Unlimited is collecting 50% profit from tenants. And whether or not they, when they acquired these, the building, um, it is up to Dream. Dream has the power to say, we are going to follow rent control. We are going to follow the guideline and actually invest some of our profits into maintaining a safe place for tenants to live in. But, but uh, Okay, but speak to the math here. The 24 out of 239 have requested assistance with paying the rent. 24 is a long way from half the residents. So why are half the residents on a rent strike when, a period, when it seems only 24 need some help? Half the residents on a rent strike are, are not asking for charity. They're not asking for favors. They're not asking for handouts from the landlord. They're asking for fairness. They're asking for rent increases that are in line with rent control. This is not about a free handout. This is about 
having a place where you can live and expect that rents are going to go up at a reasonable amount every year that your landlord won't try to excessively increase rents every year by getting around rent control and applying for these above guideline rent increases, which is what DREAM has done. And in fact, it's what DREAM has done more than any other building in the city of Toronto. Okay. Kaylee, you've heard about this? Yeah, What's your response? Like, I'm, I'm trying to just wrap, like, based on a tenant strike, and you want maintenance, and you also want low rent. And the landlords are looking at high interest rates. They are looking at you. It's been across the, the board on high interest rates. And then you have your maintenance, your contractors, your lack of, uh, of being able to get building supplies. So you want more for less. So as landlords are here trying to provide to the economy and trying to build up supply, you're wanting to have low rent. And you're saying, I'm not going to give you money in order to do that. And obviously, from what I can see from Dream, they're trying to keep up because they have bylaws and standards that they have to do as the city's requirements. And they need to do that. So as landlords are trying to look at it as a business and they shouldn't be taking their profits because that profit, they need to take that and they need to put it into another bank. They need to put in more private investors. They need to keep building more units. And if you can see tenants doing a rent strike, the only people it's going to hurt is the tenants, the tenants because you're going to be able to report that to the credit bureaus. Can I just understand, Varun, uh, let's look more broadly, not just at this one circumstance here, but if tenants go on a rent strike, if they refuse to pay their rents, uh, for what they see as perfectly legitimate reasons, but which you have already said is illegal, uh, somewhere from illegal to not cool. Uh, what, what tools do you have at your disposal as a landlord to deal with that? Um, immediately, if a tenant stops paying rent, we're going to be serving an N4 notice for non-payment of rent. Um, uh, it's a standard uh, landlord and tenant board form that indicates a tenant owes uh, X amount in dollars, in rent dollars, and that amount is owed in 14 days. And if we don't receive that rent in 14 days, we will proceed to file for eviction at the landlord and tenant board. Along with that, we will report the tenant's non-payment of rent to Equifax and TransUnion, which impacts their credit score. And along with that, of course, is if the tenant chooses to move out, they have now severely impacted their ability to secure future rent market rate rentals. Now, this is something the tenant unions do not educate tenants on. They are not telling them, please be advised, if this happens and you withhold your rent, you can be evicted. Your Equifax credit score can be impacted. Your landlord will likely not provide you a reference letter saying you were a phenomenal tenant. How then will you secure future rentals if you are evicted for non-payment? Ricardo. I have two points. One is a clarification point earlier. AGIs are applied on top of the guideline increase. So that is 2.5% plus, plus 3%. 3%. So you get your 5.5% three years in a row, when you calculate the compound, that Only is 17 per, that's 17 percent, and that's more than inflation, and that's more than wage increases. Exactly. So that's one important Only point. If it's an the second point I want to make is about the fact that we overemphasize how much small landlords characterize the, the rental market today. Mm -hmm. They are a share of the rental market, and they are a share for which we have very little actual data. They are crying poor all the time. And yet, we do not have access to their finances. We do not know what is a lot of profit for them, what's enough profit for them, where the buck stops. And you don't know because? Because the data is not available. I got a call once from the president of one of the largest REITs in the country. And it was a really good call. We were for an hour just having a good conversation, trying to understand each other's arguments. You just used a term I want to make sure people understand, a REIT, Real Estate Income Trust. It's a Real Estate Investment Trust. Investment it's trust. some of the largest landlords in the country. Yeah. And they gave me a call where we were having a really good conversation and trying to understand, genuinely understand each other's argument. And then at some point he asked, Ricardo, why do you and Martin August and all of those other researchers in your camp pick on us? Why are they always coming after us? And by now we're talking for, you know, 45 minutes. We're practically friends. I felt they need to be honest with the guy. And I said, well, in part because your finances are really open. We can go on the internet and we can actually look your financial statements in detail. And when we look at it, we see that your margin profits are really high. As Kiara mentioned, Dream Impact, more than 50% of the rent revenue is net profit, right? So with small landlords, we have no data. They cry poor, they cry poor, they cry poor, and we don't know if they're saying well, they're saying it's representative or not. And there's two I, I, quick problems with that. If I, you allow me, there's two quick problems I, for them. I do, <laughs> I do historical research, and I can tell you, I can pick any year 
any year, and I will find a news article where a small and large is arguing that they're having the hardest time than any other business. And we do have a little bit of data on Canada industry stat statistics. And you go there, you get small residential landlords that have a gross revenue under five million. And then you can compare. You can compare business that went under, margins of profit, total revenue, and small and large are average. I looked at the data over and over and over. I thought about writing it, but it was so Let's boring that I did. What, what, okay. what data for small landlords? I can show you the data of a single mom who decided to lease out her basement apartment and is now stuck with 30K data. in arrears. This is policy. We it, need it's aggregated hard to get data, aggregate not, data here for every not here tell. tell. Not here tell. Sorry, let, let, let him respond. It, it's hard to get aggregate data for every single individual small landlord. If mm -hmm. small landlords own most of, the, most of us, including me and many of my friends, we own one to two rental units. One. Just one. And many of us just rent out a unit within our primary residence. So we rent out a basement apartment, right? What, what data do you need from a family of four who have decided to lease out their basement apartment so they can help uh, meet mortgage payments, so that they can help save for the future, so that they can refinance and buy another rental property, so that they can refinance and help buy a condominium for their daughter to go to school at University of Toronto? The, the, the small landlords are being piled into corp and mixed up with corporate landlords, and are, we are not the enemy. I don't yeah. think any landlord is the enemy. I think it is um, important, once again, to illustrate that the rent strike happening at 33 King Street and the rent strikes happening in Thorncliff, um, because this isn't the only rent strike against above guideline rent increases that are happening right now, these are against very large corporate landlords. And I'd like to respond to a point that uh, Kayla made earlier. Tenants are not asking to pay less for more. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Over the last year, tenants at 33 King have been paying more for less. Because of the construction, they haven't had access to their balconies, they haven't had access to common amenities, they haven't had access to um, all kinds of things that are otherwise what they pay for in their rent, what they pay for in their rent. And on top of not having that kind of access, the landlord has been increasing their rents higher than any other rent-controlled building in the city. So of course, that adds insult to injury. Rents are going up higher than any other rent-controlled building, more above guideline rent increases than any other rent-controlled building. Um, Do you worry you're going to be thrown out? Plenty of tenants at 33 King Street worry about being thrown out because I'd like to also paint a picture of what is, what, what is 33 King Street. It's very representative, actually, of the vast majority of tenants who are living in the city under a corporate landlord. And that is they are the working class. They are seniors on fixed incomes that have been working their whole lives. Mm -hmm. They have been working their whole lives. And they say, if we don't win this, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to go. You want in on this, Kayla? Yeah, like if you look at like you 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 say that the tenants don't have access to their their balconies, and which there's a process in that the tenants can file at the landlord and tenant board to get a rebatement back on their rent because they weren't able to use a facility at that building. But the yeah. problem is the landlord and tenant board has collapsed. It's not providing justice to tenants, and it's not providing it to landlords. We did a show on that, and recently. that's mm -hmm. and this is where you get into what is the number one backlog at the landlord and tenant board: non-payment of rent. Our government put six. $1.5 million into the landlord and tenant board to hire adjudicators at $110,000 a piece to deal with people with no money. Now, wouldn't you like to go to the government and say, instead of saying, hey, big corporate landlord who is providing housing stock, how about we take that money and you can talk to the elected officials to say, can I have a portable housing benefit? Something to help me keep up with these increases. What's a portable housing benefit? It's a, it's a program that the government has issued out where a, a maximum you can get about $350 additional per month to keep people from applying to government housing. The government housing, there's a wait list for 12 years in Cambridge, Ontario and the Waterloo region, 22 years in Mississauga. We have a difference between are you affordable housing and sustainable sustainable private housing and we have to look at the difference between that but you could be asking the government for that because you I, know the tenant union the is building, not interested you need the building to main, be maintained because if not the city is going to find the landlord or they're going to come in and do it and put it to their property taxes okay. so you have Let's multiple to ways respond. to do it the tenant union is not interested in asking the government to subsidize a corporation that is making 50 percent profit off of rental income it's just not it's just not that's not our ask. Would a shelter allowance our, not be helpful to you our ask 
the, the asks of the rent strike, the rent strike demands, are specifically about above guideline rent increases. It's about this tactic that is being used excessively to get around rent control. The first one, the first demand of the rent strike is to drop the existing above guideline rent increases. The second is to commit to no more above guideline rent increases. Again, 33 King Street is the building with the highest number of above guideline rent increases, even during the rent freeze. Even during the rent freeze, when the Premier said there should be no more rent increases because of this pandemic, Dream Unlimited increased rents for their tenants 3%. And then the last, the last demand of the rent strike is about a rent abatement. It absolutely is. Because insult to injury, tenants are being asked to pay more for less. They haven't had access to a part of their unit for over a year. They haven't had access to common amenities. Okay, we understand And this. just recently... The landlord is now asking tenants to vacate the unit for three full days in order to, for them to continue to do the repairs. And I'd like to respond to something that Dream said in their statement about a previous negotiated settlement. Because it is important for the Tenant Association to note that in that previous negotiated settlement last year, tenants have tried everything. They have tried going to the Landlord and Tenant Board. They have tried marching and protesting. They have tried calling their landlord. They have tried setting up meetings. And in fact, last year, under a previous above guideline rent increase, actually sat down and negotiated that above guideline rent increase and actually did, actually did, under a negotiated settlement, have that above guideline rent increase reduced by 3%, which was a huge victory for tenants. It meant that everybody that was paying the full above guideline rent increase should have had a payment made to them by the landlord of 3%. Did that happen? No. And the reason why nobody received any of the money that they were promised in the settlement is because Dream Unlimited turned around and said, we have all of these other above guideline rent increases that we expect are going to get approved, so we don't owe you any money. Hmm. Can I understand how many rent uh, strikes are currently taking place in Ontario? There's at least one other ten uh, rent strike right now. It's on Thorncliffe Park Drive. In Toronto? In Toronto. Uh, there are three buildings there. There are on rent strikes since May 1st. Uh, their landlord is Starlight that holds some assets on behalf of PSP, the pension fund for federal public servants. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened there was similar to what Kiara said, uh, they, apl they applied for an AGI that would increase rents over two years by 10%. These are low to moderate income working families. Mm -hmm. They said, that's too much, we can't, we can't. We can bear that. Uh, after three years of a pandemic, after a year where food prices are going up by more than 10%, they tried to negotiate. The landlord did not want to negotiate. They tried again, nothing, and then they went on a rent strike. Right, but if I may, I find it important to sometimes take a step back a little bit. And we're not talking about just individual landlords and individual tenants, but there's a question here of political rights that I think that's important. Labor organized labor, they have the right to collective bargaining. And they can make their concerns and demands through that channel. Obviously, it is the responsibility of the provincial government to kind of try to find the sweet spot between landlords and tenants so that we have a good system going forward. Varun, how well do you think the current government of Ontario has done at finding that sweet spot? They're doing a horrible job. They failed. They failed landlords and they failed tenants. They have failed to uh, properly address the maintenance issues in these aging buildings. Right? You funded the, these. Pro you encouraged developers to build these purpose-built rentals in the 60s, and now you provide no assistance to keep it maintained and up to date. There isn't any new buildings. Toronto Community Housing is crumbling. It's, they're, they're awful, awful buildings infested with cockroaches, mice, mold, mildew, guns and gangs. It's, and why? It's because there's no money to maintain these buildings. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the uh, Landlord and Tenant Board, which is backlogged, as Kayla said, with L1 applications. And instead, the tenant union groups are encouraging tenants so let's back it up even more by encouraging landlords to file even more L1 applications. Kayla, I want to ask you, how concerned are you that we have two rent strikes right now in the city of Toronto, that there could be more? You know, I'm concerned for the tenants. I'm concerned, yes. and not for yeah. so much, but like the landlords are getting out of the business now. The small landlords, mm -hmm. they're getting into Portugal, they're getting into Belize, Costa Rica, Mexico, you name it, they're pulling out because of how 
broken the system actually is. To have Steve Clark to be a minister of housing and municipal affairs, we need a, a minister of just municipal affairs because what we're talking about right now is an above the guideline rent increase, thinking that it's so easy for an owner to get above the line, guideline rent increase. And I'll give you an example that a friend of ours has a $1.2 million property of value, because obviously your value means nothing unless you're selling it these days. And that was $200,000 in renovations. They waited two years, paid $200 to file for an application, and they got the total of 7.6 over three years. Or sorry, 7.1 over three years. 7.1 over three years. Yeah, so the maximum is nine. They got 7.1. And that's and it's not very easy. They're asking for information. They're asking for receipts. You have to have a copy of those receipts given to the tenants. We have to look at, we have a housing crisis. Does the government want to listen to the people who are building and managing these type of properties? Or do they want to listen to people who are obviously making it worse? I got we have 30 a housing seconds. affordability crisis. Yeah, but everybody agrees on that. Uh, in our last 30 seconds here, what do you think it will take to get the rent strike to end? We want Dream to sit down at the table and actually negotiate and not do what they did last time they negotiated with the tenants, which was fall, like totally fall through the agreement that they settled on. We want, we want Dream to sit down with the Tenant Association, negotiate on those three demands, no more above guideline rent increases, dropping the previous AGIs, and rent abatements for loss of service. And that's what it will take for when the Tenants Associations decide to stop paying, stop the rent strike, everyone pays the rent. Everyone pays the rent. This isn't about free rent and it's not about handouts. It's about fairness. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that was intense. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, a good discussion, which needs to be had. Varun Sraskanda and Kayla Andrade on the right-hand side of the table from Solo, the Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario and Ontario Landlords Watch, respectively. And on the other side of the table, Ricardo Trenjan. Uh, he's got a book called The Tenant Class. And Chiara Padovani, York Southwestern Tenant Union involved in the rent strike at 33 King in the northwest part of the city. We should just let everybody know. That's not the King Street that's downtown where all the fancy buildings are. This is in the northwest part of the city, a, a very different part of Toronto. Yes. Good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Pride will be celebrated this month with parades and lots of other very public celebrations. That's taken a lot of hard work by advocates over long decades. It might also be thanks in small part to a hidden but enduring way that members of the community have found each other. It's the subject of human rights lawyer Marcus McCann's new book. It's called Park Cruising, What Happens When We Wander Off the Path? And he joins us now. Welcome to our studio. Thank you for having me. All right, so for, I'm gonna be honest, when I was talking to people, hey, I'm doing uh, an interview about cruising. People thought boats, people thought bodies of water. Sure. What exactly is park cruising? Cruising is a way of um, making connections between people. It uses kind of non-verbal and uh, eye contact uh, as a way of signaling essentially sexual availability. And so the best comp that I have would be, people might say, we noticed each other from across the bar. And that's very different than he crowded into my personal space and uh, tried to buy me a drink even though I didn't want to. And so that, that um, difference, which is like maybe intuitive, is really about kind of a circuit of watching for cues of sexual interest, mutual interest. Mm -hmm. That's what cruising is. That can happen anywhere. It can happen in a bar. And it certainly happens in parks all over the province. All right. One of the questions that a lot of people probably are asking, is it legal? I know it's, a, it's sort of a, a nuanced question, uh, but how do we tackle that? Yeah, uh, the way that cruising is practiced by most people most of the time, there's nothing unlawful about it. There, um, if you're talking about meeting somebody in a park, uh, meeting a stranger, arranging um, an encounter, there's nothing unlawful about that. Um, the, in the, under the criminal code, under, under the um, public indecency provisions, um, you can run into a problem if you're doing it in front of other people who are like non-participants or people who don't want to, to observe it. All right. Um, let's get an idea of um, putting this in, in, in context. In Ontario here, how long uh, do you think cruising has been happening in parks just in this province alone? 
Uh, park cruising has a long history in Ontario, and we have that history primarily through court records and from um, shocked newspaper accounts. Hmm. So 100 years ago, people were cruising in Allen Gardens, for example, in Toronto and at Queen's Park. And um, in the, the alleyways in the ward where the Eaton Center is now. Okay. Um, and so people would get arrested. There would be these sort of sensationalistic newspaper accounts. And it would feed the circuit because then people would read the newspaper and be like, oh, that sounds interesting. I should go check it out. Hmm. Okay. Is in, in terms of parks, how did it become a place gay men went for intimacy? In, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, when we have our earliest records of park cruising in Toronto, um, Toronto was a, a city that was really rapidly evolving. There were um, tenement houses that were overcrowded. People didn't have kind of private, intimate spaces where they could do these kinds of activities. So people began to meet each other in the streets and laneways in the parks. Um, also around that time, there was the social purity movement that was uh, trying to engage in public reform to have a more kind of like a Victorian or kind of like <laughs> upright public appearance, which included the erection of many public bathrooms okay. for the first time in Toronto. And those immediately had the opposite of effect uh, and, and turned into places where men began to meet each other for various kinds of intimacies. Okay. Um Things have changed. When we talk about sure. 100 years ago to now in terms of where uh, the progress has made in, in queer spaces and in queer community, obviously a lot of work still needs to be done. But is park cruising gaining or losing popularity? I mean, it's hard to tell. There's, not, there's no one at the edge of the bushes with a clicker, <laughs> like at a bar saying, um, you know, counting attendance or capacity. What we do know is that in um, over the last 25 years, there's been a lot of pressure on the kind of private commercial sex on premises sites like bathhouses and backrooms in, in bars, that um, those have been in decline. And so places, uh, public spaces where, where people could meet for sexual activity, um, there's fewer of them than there used to be. At the same time, there's like a kind of intense pressure on uh, residential housing in Toronto, but now all over the province, where um, single the, the sort of idea of single people living alone in apartments where they could um, host is a bit of a fantasy when commercial or residential rents are so high. I want to bring up the, the commercial spaces, and I'm also mm -hmm. going to um, ask a question in terms of a, a little bit of a rebuttal. You know, there are apps nowadays. Yeah. There are you know, social spaces, like you talked about the bars, the gay bars that, you know, people can meet, other queer spaces, there are the bathhouses. Shouldn't parks be off limits for intimacy because there are those spaces? Or sort of help me understand that, why does that space need to exist if those spaces do? Yeah, I think people that have that objection misunderstand the way that park cruising happens most of the time. Park cruising, if there's any kind of intimacies that are happening on site, they tend to happen behind the bushes or in disused parts of the forest or in abandoned warehouses, places where non-participants are unlikely to stumble upon it. And so the idea that the, this use is, some, is somehow um, hampering other people's enjoyment of the park is just not true. I, I think of parks as being mixed use spaces where lots of different types of activities happen and they happen at different times of the day um, and you know in the context of that geography. So uh, in the book I describe how you know it would uh, park planning and infrastructure is designed to allow for these mixed use spaces to to coexist. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a park benches with garbages and a restroom for people who are picnicking. And then elsewhere in the park, there'll be a place for playing badminton. And you don't, you don't need uh, like an official prohibition or a law. People just know that playing badminton over the uh, picnic tables would be unwelcome, right. or as would picnicking under the, the, the badminton nets. <laughs> All right, um, I should mention, you know, we know park cruising can be a controversial topic, and um, even among queer communities as well. Uh, what are some queer folks, why would some queer folks in communities be unsupportive of park cruising? 
There has never been a complete consensus on park cruising. It's always been controversial, part of a handful of topics along with pornography and BDSM and um, other subjects where um, the kind of rights-based uh, assimilationist or um, we would have said assimilationist 25 years ago, right. but uh, the, uh, the kinds of cultures of respectability that some queer people think are important are threatened by the realities of park cruising. However, park cruising isn't going away, and so it's important for people who are doing that work or thinking through these issues to incorporate park cruising into their into their worldviews. You say park cruising isn't going away. I do have a quote uh, that I want to pull up uh, from your from your book that talks about the persistence of park cruising uh, for queer communities. You write, nobody should be surprised that men continue to cruise during the pandemic. We cruise through winter. We cruise through the police raids. We cruise through the AIDS crisis. Reagan is dead and we are still cruising. Uh, very powerful quote there. I, I do want to pick up on the COVID part. Uh, yeah. How did COVID affect park cruising? Because, you know, six feet apart, that was, you know, the, the mandate that was sort of given to all of Canadians to, to stay safe. But obviously, that was still going on. How did that affect park cruising? Within a few months of, uh, the, of COVID being declared a global pandemic, there was public health guidance coming out about how queer communities should engage in sexual activity. And uh, it started with uh, some New York guidance. There was some guidance out of BC that encouraged people to stay home, uh, have sex with partners in their own household, if they're going to engage in, in these kinds of activities to um, do things like uh, wear a mask and stay six feet apart. For people who are engaged in park cruising, the idea that there would be physical space between participants or the fact that you might need, have an extra degree of anonymity by wearing a mask, mm. Uh, neither of those were really barriers to, to their, their continued cruising, essentially. And ultimately, people who were meeting for sex in outdoor spaces, where they're well ventilated, there's you know, millions of cubic feet of clean air, uh, that's probably a safer activity right. than doing it in, in, uh, at home in somebody's bedroom. Uh, I, I think with COVID, there was a lot of um, people who were doing rule breaking, but doing it behind closed doors. And so it was people who had the means to have that kind of privacy were, were doing the rule breaking with impunity. And other people, especially people who are maybe from poor working class communities, who don't have the luxury of a big suburban backyard, um, were forced to, to figure out how to engage with their communities in ways that were, were more public and were more surveillable. All right, let's uh, change gears a little bit. Let's talk about police. Uh, you write that there's an unbroken line of police crackdowns on park cruising dating back at least 100 years. Uh, what are some Ontario-based examples? Uh, yes, park cruising uh, has been the site of you know, sort of periodic police interest over many, many decades. In my hometown of Hamilton, there was a um, high profile sting of cruising at uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens, for example. There's the Aurelia Opera House case. Um, I came to this story through um, the raids that happened at Marie Curtis Park in Etobicoke in 2016, but uh, there's nothing inherently um, different about that raid. It's part of a, certainly a, a sequence. The, the best data that we have is actually from Quebec, where um, through freedom of information requests, we know that between 2007 and 2017, there were at least 300 cruising stings that resulted in arrests of men for this kind of activity. All right. Uh, you talked about uh, Marie Curtis Park, uh, it was dubbed Project Marie. Tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, 72 plus men were caught. Um, you, you mentioned that this this project, uh, in terms of uh, the, the police raid itself, not that much different um, from the years previous. But 2016, not that long ago, you did sure. a lot of the legal defense uh, for the men that were caught. Um, they were given a bylaw ticket infraction for that. How did the lawsuits play out? How did this actual project? Because some people might be surprised that uh, you, you know you made the comment that some you know someone's not really sitting at the side of a bush clicking how many people are going there, but in this case there was actually someone doing that. Yeah, it, in um, in Marie Curtis Park in Etobicoke, uh, there was um, 
in particular, one police officer who was, it seems, pretty obsessed with the park cruising that was going on there. And so would go in plain clothes and wait to be solicited by men hmm. and then give them tickets for uh, sexual activity in the park. The police would also go late at night to the parking lot and block off the parking lot with a police cruiser and give everyone a ticket for, essentially for trespassing because uh, the parks are closed between midnight and 5.30 in Toronto. Closed, I, I mean, that's nominally closed, obviously. The, there's no uh, fencing that goes up right. or anything like that. So when we got word of that, a group of lawyers, including myself, organized through the law, the law Union of Ontario listserv to organize legal defenses for, for those who were affected by it. Uh, in the end, everyone who contacted us and decided to fight had those charges withdrawn, uh, although it took uh, eight or ten months to do so. I want to talk a little bit about city planning. I found this quite interesting, and I think a lot of people don't think about how there are sort of the ways that our, our, our parks are sort of planned. You, you talked about parks being closed. I think a lot of people would not understand that. What, what do you mean? There are no literal fences on these parks. Yeah. Why are they closed from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m.? But there are other ways. For example, the city of Toronto has tried to combat cruising that don't necessarily have to do with policing. You talked a little bit about, about that, but with this project and this park in particular, walk us through some, some examples of what, uh, what they're trying to do, essentially, in terms of pushing, um, you know, park cruisers to the outskirts. Yeah, I will say about the park closure, it's part of a long tradition right. of anti-vagrancy provisions that target people who are homeless, people who use drugs, people who don't have anywhere else to go. So combine the park closure bylaw with the Eventually. Safer Streets Act that um, prohibits a lot of types of activities on city streets, and people are basically criminalized for existing at night without a house. Putting that aside, the um, park planners use a variety of tools to um, to combat park cruising that are not policing. The classic one is to cut out the underbush in a, in a traditional park mm. and to put up um, fluorescent lighting at night. So that has the effect of removing the places where men would go to have more kind of private liaisons. Unfortunately, the effect is to put their activity more on display, so it can be, in some cases, quite counterproductive. Uh, in bathroom cruising, um, people, for example, have for a long time used the creaking of the door when the door is going to open so that people know to pull apart and to stop so that nobody sees anything that they're not supposed to see. But um, uh, bathroom renovations have increasingly uh, changed from a door to the kind of like envelope or Z entrance, right. which then means that there's no uh, audio cue for men to pull apart, and it leaves them more likely to be exposed and for people to have unwitting confrontations that they don't want to have. All right. You write that stories of Park's things are not burned in our collective memories the way that bathhouse raids are, such as the ones, of course, that took place in 1981. That was dubbed Operation Soap. That was target on four bathhouses. And then, of course, the lesbian bathhouse, the Pussy Palace in 2000. Why do you think that's the case? It's an interesting question. The bathhouse raids were mass arrests that took place over the course of, in the, in the case of the 1981 bathhouse raid, one night in February of 1981. Whereas with a park cruising sting or a bathroom cruising sting, people tend to be picked off one at a time. And so their experiences of being arrested or being at the police station are ones of extreme isolation. So it tends to amp up feelings of shame and sort of self, um, uh, self-hatred and uh, tamp down on the things that would be the kind of sources of solidarity. I think when you look at the various bar raids that have taken place, whether it's um, the sex, sex garage raid at, in Montreal or um, at the Bijou, for example, in, in Toronto, that those became also sites of resistance because there was a kind of natural figurehead, the people who were the organizers of the event. Mm. And so the combination of having that solidarity across people who are affected plus having people who have a strong interest in opposing it mean that very often they get a different treatment than park cruising stings. You are obviously on the, the legal side of, of a lot of this stuff, and you see sort of the language uh, that you have to deal with. And it's something, a question that you pose in the book um, is, 
what would law look like if there was a positive attitude towards sex? Break that, break that down a little bit. You use examples of sort of sex workers uh, and sort of the fight that they've had to sort of endure and deal with in, in the court system. But the language part of that, what do you mean? Yeah, the, the law tends to see uh, any kind of sexual activity only through a lens of risk, problem, danger. Um, it's not something where the courts have regularly seen or identified the positive values that can come from sexuality. And by that, I'm talking about sort of personal autonomy, um, flourishing, equality, the like um, self-expression. Uh, not that sex is always that way for everybody, mm -hmm. but it's basically never described that way in right. court documents. If we were to have that uh, kind of counterweight applied in legal scenarios, it wouldn't mean that there are no circumstances where the government has the leeway or a good reason to regulate sexuality. It would just mean that we would have to be more careful, that we would be analyzing pros and cons in a way um, that um, there would be, an, uh, uh, I, I would hope, some kind of reluctance to regulate sexuality other than in cases where there was a clear harm or a risk. You make the case that park cruising teaches people good lessons about sexual consent. How so? Yes. Uh, I mean, it, this is going to sound like a low bar, but um, the requirements of, of cruising are that people pay attention to the cues of what the other person is, is thinking and feeling. So they're looking at body language, they're looking at eye contact, they're looking at other kinds of nonverbal cues. And in so doing, they're, what they're looking for is uh, indications of mutual interest. And I, I think that is a real baseline mm -hmm. for, for establishing sexual consent. And unfortunately, we see too many examples of people who sort of plow over consent, who are not, doesn't seem like they're, they're capable or interested in receiving information about how their advances are being um, received by the by the other party, and so it, it, to that extent, it um, when you're in an extreme situation like park cruising, it requires a kind of extreme attentiveness, and I think that is something that could be um, sort of a helpful lesson for people when they're thinking about how to navigate consent in other maybe less extreme situations. All right, uh, we have a couple minutes left. I have a couple two more questions for you. Uh, there's a horrible history of gay men in Canada being murdered in parks uh, or cruising areas that you talk about in your book. Um, you write that there has never been a police project in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, or Burnaby aimed at keeping the men in, who cruise in parks safe. If, police, if more policing is not the answer, what is? There's a long history of queer people doing their own safety projects. So in San Francisco, for example, in the 70s, there was the Butterfly Brigade, where they distributed whistles and uh, clipboards, and people would go and stand on the street corner at night and record the license plates of people who were throwing beer bottles mm. at uh, people in the Castro. And those, we have evidence that those um, uh, Butterfly Brigades also were in the parks keeping park cruisers mm. safe. There's something inherent in the infrastructure of park cruising, which is the presence of other people is a protective factor. And I should say, not just for park cruisers. When we were um, doing Project Marie, opposing Project Marie, we heard from community members who said, you know, I walk my dog late at night in Marie Curtis Park, and the presence of people who are, um, you know, sort of minding their own business, doing their own thing, is something that makes me feel safer. It's a very kind of Jane Jacobs uh, <laughs> eyes on the street. Okay. And so uh, we've seen this in various cities. So for example, in Ottawa, after the murder of Ellen Brosseau in 1989, there was a real turn toward this kind of community-based policing at the same time as there were efforts for police reform. So both of those were happening in tandem. I think it's important for people who don't know that, that case. Do you mind sharing a few details with that? Yeah. Um, in uh, Majors Hill Park in Ottawa, over the course of that summer, there were a number of men who mysteriously fell off the side of the cliff toward the Ottawa River, and um, including two who had died earlier in the summer. But uh, in August of 1989, um, a, uh, a waiter in Ottawa who just got off his shift, Ellen Bousseau, was walking home toward Gatineau when he was 
um, caught by a group of gay bashers, uh, beaten up, and eventually thrown over the side of the bridge where he died. And that, it was just such a horrific um, incident that it spurred that community to do um, police reform work that lasted more than a decade. There are probably people who are watching or listening to this program and may not have the opportunity to read your book, but still say, Park cruising isn't something that I necessarily want to see when I'm going out for my walk. It's not necessarily something I want to uh, be witness to if I'm at a picnic at a park with my family or something. What is the message to them to understand sort of the importance of what, parking, what park cruising is to the queer community? If you're afraid about public displays of sexuality, then park cruising the way that it's actually practiced should actually be a comfort for you because it tends to happen in places that are quite far away from um, uh, places where other people are using the park, so behind the bushes, in a, in a for part of a forest, on the other side of a fence, that kind of thing. Also, in places that are busier parks, they tend to mostly happen late at night. And um, there are lots of uh, examples of where there's a risk of being caught or being seen, where the men will actually pull apart and stop. To some extent, there is a uh, I'm sure a kind of self-preservation that's involved with, with that. They don't want to get into a confrontation. They don't want to get arrested. But I also see that as a kind of an ethic of care, of uh, respect for non-participants, that people shouldn't be confronted with this if they don't want to see it. And so the, the practices of participants tends to reflect that. We are going to leave it there. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really great book. I really appreciate your time in the studio. Thank you for having me. And that is the agenda for Monday, June 19th, 2023. Economic development often puts the focus on businesses working in the nine to five economy. Tomorrow, we'll find out about the efforts in some cities to boost their nighttime economies as well. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.